and gentlemen, welcome to WrestleMania. Welcome to a very special episode of Tyler Vance Rants. I am your host, Tyler Vance himself, and you're not. It's March 31st, 1985, and it is the first ever WrestleMania. There's not much else to say than that, so let's jump right into it. Gorilla Monsoon and Jesse the Body Ventura are both on commentary this afternoon. And before we get to the matches... Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light... After giving such a rousing rendition of the Star Spangled Banner, Mean Gene Okerlund heads backstage to speak to Tito Santana, who is about to head to the ring himself to face off against the Executioner. Neither Okerlund nor Santana know much about the Masked Man, but if you ask Tito Santana, he states that the Executioner has not been in the quote, well, he hasn't been in the big leagues, and will soon learn the difference of competing in the World Wrestling Federation rather than those secondary promotions. As Tito Santana leaves, the Executioner arrives and he states that his objective during this upcoming match will be to focus on the previously injured leg of Tito Santana, which was injured at the hands of Greg the Hammer Valentine. Then, and only then, will everybody have an idea of who the Executioner truly is. The first ever match of WrestleMania begins next as Tito Santana and the Executioner go head to head, and early on Santana is able to hit a huge backdrop before employing a dropkick which sends the masked man careening through the ropes and taking out a cameraman. Back inside the squared circle, the Executioner is placed into a side headlock, but gets a quick jab into the back of his opponent's knee in an effort to break free. Instead, Tito Santana is prompted to slam the masked man's face into the mat. The Executioner is able to catch Santana coming off the ropes with a knee to the gut, applying a spinning toe hold but gets rolled over for a two count by Tito Santana, who goes on to unload on the Executioner in the corner, but suffers a backdrop counterattack followed up by a body slam. Going up to the top rope, the Executioner gets caught and thrown to the mat, but as Santana goes for the splash, the masked man gets his knees up at the last second. The Executioner then begins to work on Tito Santana's previously injured knee, just like promised, before he then is kicked to the floor and then brought back into the ring the hard way. Moments later, Tito Santana's combination flying forearm figure four leg lock secures him the win. The next two competitors are Special Delivery Jones, who looks to face off against relative newcomer to the WWF, King Kong Bundy. But first, Mean Gene Okerlund has a word with Jones backstage. This is apparently the moment that Jones has been waiting for, stating that I'm ready, I'm gonna get down with the biggest thing in town with King Kong Bundy. <laughs> yeah, right. I'll see it to believe it, pal. Bundy next arrives to have a word with Gene Okerlund along with his manager, Jimmy Hart. King Kong Bundy is not a man of many words, simply stating that he's going to put Special Delivery Jones down long enough for a five count. And I believe it. He's a mountain with legs and feet and arms. Jones immediately tries to charge his opponent, but instead gets caught in a bear hug. Special Delivery then suffers a huge splash from King Kong Bundy. The moment you've been waiting for, eh, Jones? Nine seconds. <laughs> mean Gene Okerlund's next guest backstage is another newcomer to the WWF in Matt Bourne, who states that his upcoming match with Ricky Steamboat, himself also a newcomer, is one that will establish Bourne's name, stating that Steamboat is just too much of a nice guy to even beat him. Ricky Steamboat then joins Gene Okerlund and states the specific reason he came to the World Wrestling Federation is to develop a mean streak and that he's gonna start with Matt Bourne. That's the reason you came to the WWF? Pal, you don't have it in you. As Bourne takes on Steamboat one-on-one, -on -one, Ricky Steamboat latches on a snapmare before employing a headlock to get things going. Matt Bourne tries to back suplex Steamboat to get free, but is instead reversed into an atomic drop. Learning from his mistake, Bourne hits a reverse atomic drop before just laying into his opponent. 
A belly-to-belly -belly suplex follows the beating, but it only gets a one. Ricky Steamboat gets to his feet, sending a fist into the jaw of Matt Bourne, which sends him careening. This opens the way for Steamboat to employ a back suplex, along with a swinging neck breaker. Two palms are then forced into Bourne's face before he suffers a flying cross body from the top rope securing a win for Ricky Steamboat. The father and son duo of the living legend Bruno and David San Martino are Mean Gene Okerlund's next guest backstage, and David reveals that he has been training hard for this night, and he is finally ready. Bruno San Martino then follows this up and states that Brutus Beefcake's manager better not stick his nose into his son's business, or the living legend will make the manager regret it. As the competitors make their way down to the ring, the Madison Square Garden audience gives Bruno San Martino a standing ovation. Standing ovation here in the garden just for the living legend. Once the match gets underway, David San Martino shoves Brutus Beefcake into the corner and then employs a drop toe hold as Beefcake attempts to rebound. So Johnny Valiant has a word with his client. Back inside the squared circle, San Martino employs a front face lock before Valiant's client gets to the ropes, forcing a break. Brutus Beefcake attempts a body slam, but David San Martino latches onto his arm and then begins to focus on damaging it. Beefcake responds with a massive shoulder block and then a hip toss, but gets kicked in the face and suffers another drop toe hold from San Martino. Inspired by Johnny Valiant at ringside, Brutus Beefcake follows all of this up with a backdrop and a body slam and then an elbow to the face explains just why David San Martino is so damn ugly. San Martino proceeds to reverse an Irish whip and then hits a huge backdrop on Beefcake. A suplex immediately follows which results in a near fall for the living legend's son. David San Martino is thrown to the outside of the ring as Brutus Beefcake returns to his feet, so Valiant tries to help the young San Martino back inside the squared circle. This prompts the elder San Martino to chase Valiant in between the ropes, where he's then ambushed. What an idiot! All four men brawl in the ring, and the referee calls an end to the match, disqualifying both competitors. If Bruno San Martino hadn't inserted his gigantic nose into the match, Brutus Beefcake would be standing victorious atop his son's broken body. The first of three championships will be on the line next this afternoon, with the WWF Intercontinental Championship being put on the line as Greg the Hammer Valentine defends against the rabid junkyard dog. Mean Gene Okerlund has a word with the champion along with his manager, the Mouth of the South, Jimmy Hart, next, and Valentine states that everyone is about to find out exactly why he is the greatest WWF Intercontinental Champion of all time. The hammer is ready to strike. Then the Junkyard Dog simply barks the following at Mean Gene Okerlund before the match begins proper. You gonna see one of the nastiest individuals ever come in the world. The dog heads down to the ring as Queen's Another One Bites the Dust plays and according to Lord Awful Alfred Hayes on a recent WWF update, the dog has plans to play it should he somehow be successful against Greg Valentine, who also has plans of his own which were concocted recently on an episode of TNT by his manager Hart. When Greg the Hammer Valentine is successful in defending his WWF Intercontinental Championship, He's made arrangements so that Queen's Another One Bites the Dust can be played while the hammer stands atop the dog that he put down. With the match officially underway, Greg Valentine gets caught trying to kick the junkyard dog and catches a right hand in response. JYD then slams his head into the hammers, showing just how crazy this rabid animal truly is, forcing Valentine to have a word with the mouth of the south on the ring apron. Refilled with confidence, Greg Valentine hits a lumbering forearm to the back of the junkyard dog's neck, before starting to prepare the dog's legs for the hammer's figure four leg lock, but he's kicked away instead. 
JYD sends Fist after Fist into Valentine's head before headbutting him, knocking the hammer down. Jimmy Hart rightfully takes issue with the fact that the referee didn't do a damn thing when the dog was employing closed fists to his client's head, as well as right now after grabbing a handful of Valentine's hair. So the rabbit animal grabs the manager instead. Referee, do your job and disqualify this lunatic before you call animal control. Greg Valentine attempts to go to Jimmy Hart's rescue, but winds up doing more harm than good. Both the hammer and the junkyard dog then get into a fist fight. Thinking quick, Valentine knocks the dog onto his back and gets a completely legitimate three count. The WWF Intercontinental Championship is staying home, baby. What the hell is Tito Santana doing here? Wait a minute. The referee is trying to say this match still continues. Yes, he is. Unreal. Where did the World Wrestling Federation get this clown referee? The NWA bargain bin? The match is restarted, but the mouth of the South knows just how unjustifiable this decision is. So he stands firm as the WWF Intercontinental Champion gets counted out so the junkyard dog can be handed a victory that he didn't even earn. Too bad championships don't change hands on a count out, sucker. The second set of championships on the line next are the WWF Tag Team Championships. So Mean Gene Okerlund has a quick word with the challengers, the Iron Sheik and Nikolai Volkov, along with their manager, Classy, Freddie Lassie. The Iranian and Russian duo state that this is the best time of their combined lives, and they are so eager and excited to become the next WWF Tag Team Champions that they simply head down to the ring, while the champions themselves, Barry Windham and Mike Rotundo, along with their manager, Captain Loser Albano, speak to Gene Okerlund next. All Captain Loser Albano can do is hope that the U.S. Express are victorious this afternoon. But that's all he can do at this point. Hope. Before the match begins, Volkov attempts to sing the Soviet Russian National Anthem. But the New York City animals occupying Madison Square Garden drown him out in booze, while also pelting him with garbage. <laughs> Keep it classy, New York. The WWF Tag Team Champions make their way down to the ring to Bruce Springsteen's Born in the USA, proving that Springsteen himself is sure the boss, but only of horrible music. At the sound of the bell, the Iron Sheik hits Mike Rotundo with a shoulder block, but gets hit with a hip toss, dropkick, and body slam in return. The WWF Tag Team Champions then proceed to double team the Iron Sheik in their corner as Barry Windham gets the tag. It quickly turns into Windham's turn to be double teamed, but that backfires for the challengers. The Iron Sheik senses danger, and so he tags in Nikolai Volkov to keep the match going. Wyndham gets cold feet, so he tags in his fresh partner, Mike Rotundo, who gets to meet the Iron Sheik's boot up close and personal. Rotundo suffers a back and elbow drop for a near fall before a gut wrench suplex from the Iron Sheik results in another two count. Mike Rotundo then reverses a suplex from the Iron Sheik, which results in Volkov once more getting the tag, who drapes Mike Rotundo neck first over the top rope before delivering a knee to the WWF Tag Team Champion's gut. Captain Loser Albano tries to instigate an altercation with classy Freddy Blassie, while inside the squared circle, the Iron Sheik is once more tagged in and places Mike Rotundo into an abdominal stretch, but he is able to break free with a hip toss. Barry Windham finally gets into the match and unleashes in a fury on Nikolai Volkov, applying a bulldog. It's not long before all four men wind up brawling in the ring, and while the referee argues with Mike Rotundo, the Iron Sheik uses his manager's cane to give Windham a helping hand. One, two, three. We have new WWF Tag Team Champions. I knew it. I called it. I am always right. The Iron Sheik, Nikolai Volkov, and classy Freddie Blassie have a quick word with Mean Gene Okerlund backstage following their victory. 
And when Okerlund refers to their win as controversial match, what do you mean controversial? He not only upsets myself, but more importantly, Freddie Blassie. Where's that cane of yours? What cane? I would, didn't have no cane. Mean Gene Okerlund's next guests are the true giant of the WWF, Big John Studd, and the patriarch of the Heenan family himself, Bobby the Brain Heenan. The bag Stud has brought with him to the interview is filled with the $15,000 that Andre, the so-called giant, could win if he should somehow be successful in slamming Stud this afternoon. When he does fail, however, the eighth wonder of the world will be forced to retire from professional wrestling. So John Stud promises that this match upcoming will be the final match of Andre, the so-called giant. At the sound of the bell, Stud immediately attacks Andre from behind, but the so-called giant responds with a headbutt before kicking the true giant out of the ring. Once back inside the squared circle, Andre the so-called giant strangles Big John Stud right in plain view of the referee who simply stands there like a mook. Honestly, Vince McMahon, you could afford to fund WrestleMania, but you can't pay for decent officials? The eighth wonder of the world slams himself into his opponent in the corner since he has a free pass to do whatever the hell that he wants in this match. Latching on a bear hug before releasing the hold and chopping stud and kicking the true giant of the WWF in the leg multiple times. No, this can't... No! This is even worse! Those animals didn't earn that money! Thank goodness for Bobby Heenan because this is honestly the worst case scenario. If we haven't had enough pain from Andre the Giant, he is Mean Gene Okerlund's next guest backstage, and he reveals that he didn't even care about winning the $15,000 at all. Instead, he took pride in embarrassing Big John Studd and Bobby the Brain Heenan. Pride is a sin, you know. The final of the three championships will be on the line next, as the WWF Women's Championship will be contested, so Mean Gene Okerlund has a word first with the challenger, Wendy Richter, who has brought her pop star manager, Cindy Lauper, with her. Lauper states, stupidly, that she has become one of the greatest professional wrestling managers of all time, ever since Captain Loser Albano had a ridiculous change of heart and he has since passed on as much sleazeball, slimeball, scumbag advice as he possibly could, which has resulted in the pop star being dead set on Richter reclaiming the WWF Women's Championship from Leilani Kai, who is Gene Okerlund's next guest, alongside her manager, the fabulous Moolah. Kai is completely focused on defending the WWF Women's Championship, and simply states that she'll do whatever it takes to do so. Clearly, her mind is more in the game, as while she and Moolah head down to the ring in silence, focused, Cindy Lauper and Wendy Richter treat the match like a beach party, as girls just wanna have fun, plays, and so that slimy David Wolf joins in on the fun. The two women vie for control until Richter is able to apply a hammerlock on Kai. Leilani Kai then strangles Wendy Richter but winds up getting caught in a leg scissors trap instead. Richter gets grabbed from the outside by the fabulous Mula, which prompts Cindy Lauper to she-bop all over her managerial counterpart. While all this is happening, Kai manages to catch her opponent in the chest with a huge boot before Richter gets her caught with a huge slam. Wendy Richter then charges Leilani Kai in the corner, meeting her knees. Near fall! A backbreaker from Kai results in the closest to a three we've gotten so far before the WWF Women's Champion heads to the top rope and hits the challenger with a flying cross body, but Richter uses the momentum to roll her opponent over. New champion, no! The static is Cindy Lauper and Wendy Richter! Mean Gene Okerlin then catches the new WWF Women's Champion her manager, and that clown David Wolf, while Cindy Lauper simply states that she always knew that her client had it in her, while Wendy Richter herself states, You cut me at the happiest second of my life. It's time for the main event of the biggest spectacle in pro wrestling of 1985. But before we get to the competitors, the celebrity guests are introduced. 
Baseball great Billy Martin, the guest ring announcer. Liberace, the guest timekeeper, who brings his Rockettes down to the ring in grand fashion. And finally, boxing legend Muhammad Ali as the special guest referee. Well, I should say one of the special guest referees. As you see, Pat Patterson will be acting as the second. Patterson will officiate what happens inside the ring, while Ali will be responsible for what happens outside of it. I'd personally rather have Muhammad Ali in the center of the ring for everyone to see and Pat Patterson be in the trash where he belongs, but I'm just glad that both Rowdy Roddy Piper and Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff, who are played to the ring by a brigade of bagpipers playing Scotland the Brave, are finally going to be able to crush Hulkamania in front of millions. Survivors. Eye of the Tiger plays both WWF Champion Hulk Hogan and Mr. T down to the ring, and the two teams almost get into an altercation before the match even begins. Piper and Mr. T start things off for their respective teams with a slapping contest, and as Mr. T gets Hot Rod up for a slam, he's then speared into enemy territory which results in a huge melee breaking out with everyone, and I do mean everyone, involved. Muhammad Ali even takes a swing at Cowboy Bob Orton. Roddy Piper, Paul Orndorff, and Bob Orton say screw this and head to the locker room. There's absolutely no way that they're going to compete when the odds are so biasly stacked against them. But while Pat Patterson goes to count the trio out, Hulk Hogan stops him. It's a setup! Hulk Hogan had the NYPD on the take as the cops forcibly escort the trio back to the ring where they're then ambushed. The WWF Champion gets the tag and hits Roddy Piper with a huge boot to the face which sends the Scotsman to the floor. Paul Orndorff then attacks the Hulkster from behind which sends the WWF Champion to the floor where Piper awaits with a chair. Another brawl breaks out inside the squared circle once all four men are back in the ring and eventually Mr. Wonderful is able to get an upper hand on the WWF Champion delivering a huge suplex and a backbreaker. Heading up to the top rope, Paul Orndorff misses a diving elbow drop, which allows Hulk Hogan to get a desperate tag to Mr. T, who goes to town on his opponents. Bob Orton attempts to stop Jimmy Superfly Snooka from interfering illegally, but ends up getting headbutted to the floor instead. This prompts another brawl to break out, but as Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff sets WWF Champion Hulk Hogan up, Cowboy Bob Orton's cast just narrowly misses him as Hulk Hogan moves out of the way at the last second, crushing Mr. Wonderful's cranium. The cowardly Hogan then uses this opportunity to dive atop his fallen opponent to get the win. Infuriated with the rigged officiating, Rowdy Ronnie Piper strikes Pat Patterson before heading to the locker room with his bodyguard in tow. When Paul Orndorff comes to, Mr. Wonderful has to be told what happened, which sends him into a fury too. Backstage, Mean Gene Okerlund has a quick word with the victors, and Mr. T reveals that while he found the match incredibly tough, he adds, It's rough out there. It's not for no wimps wrestling. You got to be ready. WWF Champion Hulk Hogan leapfrogs off of the actor's words, stating that he knew that he and Mr. T had it in them all along, before stating, Hulk Hogan, Mr. T, Superfly Jimmy Snooker, we reign supreme. Can you dig that? What a spectacle! Two championships changed hands as the Iron Sheik and Nikolai Volkov became the new WWF Tag Team Champions by defeating the US Express of Barry Windham and Mike Rotundo, along with Wendy Richter usurping Leilani Kai as the new WWF Women's Champion. The Junkyard Dog was declared the winner after controversial circumstances during his match for the WWF Intercontinental Championship against Greg the Hammer Valentine, while Andre the Giant slammed Big John Studd in front of millions across the world. Guest ring announcer Billy Martin declared WWF Champion Hulk Hogan and Mr. T to be the winners of the main event, defeating Rowdy Roddy Piper and Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff. What happens from here? I don't have any idea, but I do know one thing for certain. 
professional wrestling will never be the same. Thanks for tuning in to a very special episode of Tyler Vance Rants. If you want to see how professional wrestling changes in real time, make sure to hit the bell, like the video, and subscribe. And you can also follow me on social media where it is 1985 in pro wrestling all over again. That's all for now. So long. Whew. Mere seconds later, Tito Santana's flying forearm figure four leg. <laughs> Damn it. The WWF Tag Team Champions make their way down to the ring to Bruce Bing... Uh, uh, bah, bah, Bruce Bing Beanstein. Honestly, Vince McMahon, you could afford to fund WrestleMania, but you couldn't afford to pay for decent officials? <laughs> no.